Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to add my voice to uh, the choir that sings the praise of this uh, wonderful meeting. I think uh, we're all extremely impressed by the generous hospitality and the great organizing skills, uh, but also with the uh, great uh, quality of the research here in China. And I think, you know, uh, it's not only the absolute value, but also the first derivative and perhaps second and third that uh, give us great promise also, I think, for our field. Uh, and I also want to tell the organizers that they can start relaxing. I think we passed the point of no return. We can officially declare this uh, Strings 2016 a success, which means that I can actually give a slightly more risky talk. Uh, and I will uh, be talking about a paper that's on the archive with uh, Ben Heidenreich, uh, Patrick Jefferson, and Kumun Wafa, uh, discu discussing a, a number of topics that um, are uh, controversial. Um, I think uh, one of the things clearly we need in string theory, apart from lots of great papers and technical results, is also some kind of crazy ideas, how we can really probe uh, what are the fundamental properties of our theory. And so the ideas that I want to uh, discuss today are all, in some sense, might raise immediate suspicion, and I hope that you somehow are able to, at least for a few minutes, uh, suspend uh, your disbelief. Um, so I want to, the, the topic I'm talking about is gate theories based on uh, gates groups, which are supergroups. Now, as I will argue, this related to many other kind of controversial topics, namely the, pr the presence of negative energy states, negative energy or negative tension brains, uh, closely connected to non-unitarity and non-unitary theories. What is the role they play uh, in physics in general? but in particular in string theory and to which extent can we prove the existence of such non-unitary theories. We're also discussing the issue of the signature of space-time, in particular the issue of more than one time variable and how these signature changes can happen in quantum gravity. Uh, and also I think I want to say a few words about uh, various kind of exotic string theories that have been discussed in the literature. And the main point I will be making is that all these topics are connected. Um, and uh, just to set the stage, so we're discussing super gauge theories that, uh, in particular, you know, the most simple form is just a unitary group. So just unitary rotations, <coughs> not in a bosonic space, but in a super space, a space that has uh, bosonic coordinate z and fermionic coordinate theta. So we'll be talking about u n slash m. And uh, that means that uh, all the variables, in particular the gauge fields, will be a matrix, a super matrix, whose uh, off-diagonal components, B and C, will be odd, so anti-commuting, but of course the field is a, a one form. So that means that we have ghost-like variables and immediately see that uh, theories based on these supergroups will be non-unitary theories. Uh, they violate <coughs> the spin statistics theorem. Um, actually, in perturbation theories, these super gauge uh, theories are extremely simple. So remember uh, that if we do a planar expansion, uh, so with the double line diagram, then what we'll do whenever we have a loop, we just count the number of indices. But of course, here they will be counted with uh, minus signs. So in the gauge group U and M, if we have a loop, we get uh, from the first part, we get the contribution N, from the second, we get the contribution M. And so the only effective uh, coefficient there is N minus M. So this is the first important properties of these theories, that perturbatively, the gauge theory un slash m cannot be distinguished from the ordinary uh, bosonic gauge theory un minus m. So whatever these theories are, with all their kind of probably sick properties, and I won't make any definite statements about the existence of these theories, I would just will play, I want to flesh out the various parts where they are uh, surface. Um, whatever the properties are, non perturbative perturbative, they're perfectly fine and indistinguishable from the ordinary UN gauge theory. Now, why would you consider these kind of supergroups? So, this, uh, so these are the topics that we will see. So, we'll see it's that whenever we consider brains uh, with these uh, supergroups on their world volume theories, we'll, we'll be naturally led to consider string theory compactifications which have a different kind of signatures. Um, 
And another important element of this is, and that's a kind of grand topic, that it's kind of, uh, I won't have anything very specific to contribute, but one of our grand problems is, of course, using these wonderful ideas about holography to say something about the natural emergence of time. So whenever we have to do that, uh, we already see you have great problems because the theory out which this time uh, emerged should be a, a theory without time, so it should, for instance, be a Euclidean theory. And the time variable will have kind of a negative direction. So uh, uh, even in the most simplified way of thinking about this, we'll produce a theory, say, on the brain, that will have negative directions. Um, in fact, uh, these kind of holographic ideas about the emergence of time, of course, intimately connected to cosmological models, where we uh, have to think much more in terms of uh, you know, a particular state that develops a non-equilibrium non state developing in time, and we can't take the usual kind of S-matrix point of view. As I will argue in a moment, it's also closely connected to the issue of whether we should, at so in certain contexts, consider second quantization of brains. Uh, the, the, the existence of virtual brain configurations. And it's also connected to this uh, question that we have been probing. What is the complete spectrum of uh, objects uh, in M-theory and string theory? And finally, it's connected to this issue, to which extent are our perturbative theories completely uniquely determined? And are there possibly various different non-perturbative completions? And I will finally say something of an, another crazy idea. In some way, can these theories be used to look behind the horizon of a black hole? Now, <laughs> the brain realization of supergroup theories is, uh, is in some sense well known. Um, they have a, what I will call them negative brains. Um, in this paper of Okuda and Takanayaki, they were called ghost brains. Uh, so negative brains, if you have a set of uh, and negative brains will just have this property that they will just behave as any other uh, brain as the standard positive brains, the string perturbation theory. However, we have a loop will associate uh, negative, say, minus one times the uh, chen Payton indices. So, for instance, if you have a bunch of positive brains on the left, negative brains on the right, and you think of this, for instance, as angular, uh, this um, cylindrical one-loop diagram will con contribute n on the left-hand side and minus m on the right-hand side. Um, so in that sense, you basically are analytically continuing n to uh, negative values. Now, one uh, important point just to distinguish that these kind of negative brains are not anti-brains. And uh, think about the BPS configuration, so standard brain a positive BP will have a positive charge and also positive tension, and the BPS condition will say that they are equal. Uh, Antibrains will then have negative charge, um, they're like the antiparticles, but of course positive energy or tension, so they will have a different relation the mass equals minus the charge. Uh, negative brains uh, will have negative charge but also negative energy, so they will satisfy the same BPS condition, and that is to say they satisfy the same set of supersymmetry uh, conditions. So you can consider positive and negative brains at the same time, uh, preserving the full supersymmetry you uh, you're originally imposed. Uh, so the one way to think about it is, is more in terms of the Dirac C, um, where the negative brains are kind of filled up to the Dirac level, and then the positive brains are the excitations on top of it, the anti-brains will be the holes created by removing one of the negative brains. So we're basically thinking in the, we can kind of use our intuition of particles and antiparticles. And, uh, and this brings me to my remark that this is closely connected to the issue of quantization. Because think about just pair creation. You would typically create uh, two particles out of the vacuum. And clearly like, uh, they would have opposite energies. So you can think of this as uh, creating, <coughs> of course it's a virtual pair, not both of them can be on shell, and uh, you will typically create a, uh, a brain, a positive brain and a, ne a negative brain at the same time. This configuration would then be described, if it's a collection of n of these brains, by the theory un slash n. And, it's, um, 
And of course, being brains, uh, they would have a collection of open strings connecting them, and these would be kind of the ghost-like degrees of freedom that cause uh, all the trouble. So, in the usual configurations, we think of brains as just going straight up, but suppose you would allow, as we do in general in Feynman diagrams, would uh, relax our rules and consider brains as much more like virtual particles, like as if the brains would appear in the path integral. If they would appear in the path integral, we would have uh, arbitrary configurations where the brain can also go back in time and up in time again. And if it does that uh, k times, the gate theory you would typically have on this set would be uh, one of these supergroups where k uh, could be arbitrary. In fact, uh, in, in many ways, these theories suggest that perhaps the best way to look at these supergroups is uh, not look at uh, UN, but look at basically various super selection sectors, where the gauge group is UN plus K slash K. And this means that we are allowing these virtual pairs of an extra K brains, positive and negative brains. Now, clearly these theories have great difficulties. Uh, if you look at the Lagrangian of a super yang mill theory, it will have, uh, even in the, if you just concentrate on the bosonic uh, gauge fields, will have uh, two components, uh, the UN, well, the, 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 the first and the second component. The second component has a, has a negative uh, sign in front of its kinetic term. So it's clearly, it clearly has very different dynamical properties. And, that, and the same thing happens for scalars. So the scalars come also with negative coefficients. And by the way, this is the first indication, again, at a very naive level, that if you use these theories in a context of holography, the kind of variables, the orthogonal directions that they will kind of generate, will come with different signatures. So this kind of uh, immediately connects to this issue of uh, generating time-like variables in holography. So as I said, you know, there's a, a, a question, but the answer could very well be no. But uh, does these uh, non-unitary yang mill series exist? It's completely directly related to the question whether there is a unique non-perturbative comp completion of the perturbative framework. Because again, all these theories would have exactly the same perturbative expansion. Uh, they clearly are non-unitary, so there are basically two ways to think about these theories. You can either think of them in terms of uh, negative energy states, it clearly creates a large instability of the theory. Uh, another, uh, another way to actually uh, approach these theories is instead uh, thinking in terms of negative norm states, which are of course also problematic. Now, uh, in general, there is this issue uh, where we, I think, have very little knowledge about the existence of non-unitary quantum field theories. Now, in two dimensions, of course, we, there are lots is known, and we have many examples of uh, well-defined non-unitary conformal field theories and quantum field theories in two dimensions. For instance, the PQ minimal models for arbitrary P and Q. In fact, in the condensed matter literature, there are many two-dimensional non-unitary uh, field theories in two dimensions based on supergroups. So there's a huge literature actually using exactly Super, super groups as an ingredient for WGW models based on it that make their appearance in various kind of condensed matter applications. Now, uh, in higher dimensions, there are some examples. We heard uh, some of it uh, already uh, during the string conference, uh, like the Lee Yang edge singularity can be extended beyond dimension two, uh, phi cube theory, critical N model, and there are some numerical results. But this is largely uncharted territory. I think it's incredibly interesting. Um, Particularly, again, I want to emphasize that we might need these theories in terms of our holographic description of actually well-defined unitary uh, string theory uh, space-time models. Now, uh, one way uh, that you might say that if you uh, to deal with these kind of non-unitary theories would consider, you know, a different kind of action. So, for instance, even so, th for instance, consider a Euclidean theory. Uh, with one of these supergroups, by putting an I into the action, you would actually uh, uh, and, and make, in some sense, these kind of negative directions much less harmful because it would just be an oscillating integral. And of course, this is all connected to the question, I mean, should these theories perhaps be defined by choosing appropriate contours 
in complexified field space. In some sense, we can make sense of any of these theories by just by definition picking the contours in field space where the action is well defined. Now, there are, I will come back to that, there are certain models like matrix models where we do exactly that. But one of the lessons we learned there that we have learned in, in that context is that the path integrals that we define, the theories that we define, will not, the path integral will not be a number, but will more something like a holomorphic block. So it will depend on certain choices and actually will transform in a non-trivial way under the various symmetries. So you will get more like a vector of possible partition functions that would transform into itself uh, instead of just a well-defined number. Now, I also want to, as a little aside, that these uh, gate theories have also been used in uh, a, a large body of work by Tim Morris and his collaborators studying the exact reorganization group uh, of ordinary yang mill theories. So the idea there is that you replace SUN by SUN slash N, so we have a second copy. Um, then you Higgs the theory, where you make the off-diagonal components very massive. And uh, so now we have basically two copies of the gauge field, A plus and A minus. A minus has the wrong sign. Um, so it basically behaves like a pauli villars field. And, um, and I said the fermionic gauge fields become very massive after symmetry breaking. And the theory here is that if you do that, you can do the RG flow uh, without the need of any gauge fixing. So it's quite a beautiful body of work that uh, using uh, actually the, the whole BV field formulation is able to describe the exact normalization group while explicitly keeping the SUN gauge symmetry. So here the philosophy is that if, because we break the two, uh, the UN slash N in these two copies, that if they are kind of far enough removed, so to say, in energy space, uh, you, uh, by uh, exciting the usual gauge field A plus, the coupling is weak enough so that in some sense the A minus field is kind of stayed uh, in, the, in the vacuum state, uh, even though there is a, uh, an, an instability. Uh, you can still kind of work only with the A plus fields. Now, uh, an, an, an immediate question is, what is in some sense the space-time description of these negative brains? Now, I, I just remind you of how the black D-brain geometry looks like in string frames. So here's the famous uh, expression with the function H written down. And of course, you immediately see you get an issue if these coefficients ni, which is the, is the charge of the brain, can be allowed to become negative, because the function h will no longer be a strictly positive function. It can have zeros. Now, perturbatively, when g-string is very small, clearly these coefficients can be ignored, and we, it's a nice object in flat space-time. That's why string perturbation theory makes sense in the presence of these negative brains. But the moment you turn on the string coupling constant, as I said, H will can have typically get zeros. So you get uh, something very different. In fact, you get the, this uh, negative D brain will be surrounded, not sure what happened here, will be surrounded by a sphere um, where, uh, uh, where actually a naked singularity appears. Uh, so we actually have a very singular situation where the space time is cut off, there's this naked singularity, and then there's the interior in this little uh, ball surrounding. Uh, the, the D brain, uh, the size of which is proportional to, to G string times N. Now, um, in fact, uh, it's interesting to look at the simplest possible example first, which is the D zero brain. So, um, in fact, in that case, we can actually describe the theory directly in 11 dimensions. Remember, the zero brain is just a particle, is just a gravitational wave with a certain momentum in the 11 direction. And in fact, you get, uh, this is the general expression you get in 11 dimensions, where the y coordinate is the 11th coordinate, which would be typically periodic, or the, the period is related to the string coupling constant. And if we allow negative D0 brains, this function h will have the property that it's close to the location of these negative brains. It will uh, go to, through zero, so it will have a behavior like this. Now, the remarkable thing is that this, this uh, space-time is a perfectly smooth uh, space-time. In fact, it's just a PP wave. And so nothing singular happens at h equals zero in 11 dimensions. So this is the space-time picture in 11 dimensions. 
So these are the coordinates. So y is the left dimension, t is the, is the time coordinate, x is, 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 uh, is the one of the nine space-like coordinates in the type 2 A string theory. And you see the light codes are tilting. The light cones are tilting. And you know, originally, uh, far away from the D0 brain, these, the 11 dimension is space-like. But if we move across that, uh, what is a singularity, so if you project the space-time into 10 dimensions, here we get the naked singularity, it's exactly at the point where uh, the, uh, the DDY vector becomes null. And if we pass that point, actually becomes time-like. So what actually is happening in this geometry is that the 11 dimension becomes a time-like signature and the 10 dimensional space of the type 2 theory com becomes completely Euclidean. And so we get uh, basically a closed time-like loop. So this is perfectly fine in the decompactified infinite string limit, string coupling limit. But you see the issue of the negative brain is ex exactly equivalent to the question whether we want to allow uh, periodic identifications of time. Now, one property you immediately see is if you look at the M2 brains in this theory and you compactify down to 10 dimensions, you get fundamental strings which differ on two sides of the singularity of the horizon. So uh, on one, of course, we get the usual uh, Lorentzian signature of fundamental strings. But the other side, clearly because the 11 dimensions are time-like, the strings that we get in this 10-dimensional space-time will be uh, with Euclidean 10-dimensional space-time will be Euclidean strings. So this is a general phenomena. If you look these, uh, do these objects and we go through the singularity, not only the signature will change, but also the objects living in that particular bubble of space-time will be different. So in fact, you can do this quite general, the analytic continuation. And um, so what you have to do, uh, there are various kind of uh, H will, of course, will become negative. You see there are square roots, so there will not be kind of uh, imaginary numbers. But the claim is that by analytically continuing the metric and the dilaton, we are able to get to a slice of space-time variables, where actually we get a perfectly fine metric, however the signature changes. So this is the picture that I want to suggest, that if you have a negative TP brain, uh, and we continue through the singularity, we actually get a bubble where a number of the variables are flipped. So instead of having one time-like variable, we have p time-like variables. Now, this does actually seem to make sense because if you take a probe, a BPS probe, so we take another D-brain and you move across the singularity, you can actually see that in the, in the supersymmetric situation, the tension of, the, of that object, or the tension density, scales with the positive power of, K, of h. So h might have a zero. But the tension, so the tension will pick up a zero, but it won't have a singularity. So it looks like these probes, probes can move inside the bubble. Now clearly there are massive amount of problems with having more than one time. The most obvious one is that the Cauchy problem is ill-stated. It's no longer hyperbolic. Uh, even in free field theory, we don't have hyperbolic uh, equations, so there's not a good initial value problem. Um, and basically what you get is you get, so E squared is P squared, but P squared now can be uh, negative, so that instead of having an oscillating solution where E, the energy is real, the energy can be now imaginary and you get kind of uh, exponential functions that blow up, which really kind of completely messes up uh, your behavior. Now, there is some way to deal with these equations, at least for free fields, that might be interesting. So the solution there is to put some constraints on the fields, which are non-local. That is, you go to momentum space, it's actually a very uh, simple idea. You go to momentum space and just impose that the initial values uh, condition, so the, 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 the spatial field, which is now living in a space which can have a signature that has time-like directions, uh, so p squared is not necessarily positive. You just constrain yourself to some component of that space of positive uh, momentum, so space-like momentum. And actually, uh, in this context, the, uh, the wave equation is well-defined. But of course, it's not at all clear that this can be extended to an interacting theory where you can get, obviously get mixing of various variables. I must say something. This is not entirely unknown to string theorists, because there are very context in string theories, for instance, in BPS sums, where we do look at, for instance, theta functions, 
which look like the ordinary theta functions, but they are defined on lattices of indefinite signatures. And again, there, you can make this naive assumption by essentially restricting, instead of summing over all momenta, you sum only with those with positive p squared. And remarkably, with appropriate details, the theta functions are still modular invariant. So it looks like that idea is, in some sense, not totally foreign to string theory. Now, this is all connected to a huge body of work that was triggered by a paper from a long time ago with Chris Hall, who took, did exactly this exercise. He took type 2 string theory, M theory, compactified on a circles that would have time-like time -like circles, and then consistently implied t-duality and s-dualities and uh, looked what he got. And what you then find, you find a whole zoo of new types of string theory and M theories. In fact, um, uh, you get M theories, and th you can distinguish them in, basically in the following way. For instance, the type 2 theories will have fundamental strings, obviously, and D1 and D2 brains. And each of them can come either in a Euclidean or a Lorentzian signature. And in M theory, these spaces can come uh, with M2 brains that either have the usually 2,1 signature or are completely Euclidean. And in fact, then there is this, if you just follow uh, the concept, you get this whole web of string theories where the M plus and the 2B plus plus and 2A plus plus are the canonical three compactifications that we consider. So all of these others are more exotic theories that, conclude, that include brains and strings with different, different world volume signatures. In fact, if you just then follow this, and it's completely consistent with the classification of negative brains, you get this huge web of possible space-time signatures for these classes of, of string theories and M theories, which is very rich. It's totally consistent. And in fact, uh, allowing one of them, for instance, the D0 brain, already gives this uh, indication. Now, finally, I think you know, it's good to say that there is um, there's also a way in which we can do the ADS-CFT in this context. Um, it's kind of interesting because you create bubbles of space-time uh, with, uh, with different signatures uh, by taking the new horizon limit of these, uh, for instance, D3 brains and get to uh, this kind of different types. Uh, in fact, this might be interesting for cosmological, um, possible cosmological applications where um, uh, you might naively think you need something like the following. So you could think of like if you want to have a holographic model of a cosmological solution, you start with a 3D gauge theory with a gauge group UN slash N. So it's a bunch of N D3 brains and positive and negative D3 brains. Create a, a, a geometry where in some sense the, the, the negative D3 brains are surrounded by a bubble of positive D3 brains. So the space time will be created inside here. And you will create a space with, uh, if you have a single scalar field, would create typically a signature 3,1 inside this bubble. Where in some sense the, uh, so this is very similar to the model described, uh, used in exact realization group flow. It would actually be uh, the length, I mean, the mass scale describing the realization group um, context would actually be proportional to the cosmological distance here. Um, so finally, I want to say a few words about uh, how this can be imposed in uh, n equals 2 theory context. Um, so uh, it's remarkable that you know, we, if these theories exist in n, for n equals 2, they will have very well-defined uh, cyber witten uh, curves. Um, in fact, this is the usual cyber witten curve for SUN. You know, you're all familiar to that. And our claim is that for the supergroups, it's actually exactly the same. However, you now replace the determinant by the superdeterminant. So instead of having a polynomial variable here, you will have a, a rational function. And, um, and in fact, by just multiplying this with x minus b, you see that actually this is, proportional, this is equivalent to a, a curve that we know very well, which is SUN with two m matter fields. Now, there are various ways to understand that we just want to uh, do a very simple derivation of this using uh, this brain diagram. So here, this as an exercise, we'll just take SUN plus K and 2K flares and Higgs it. So here are metal fields. We can bring them down, and then we can lift off these uh, D4 brains and actually get just a collection like this. That's the, the usual story. Uh, for negative brains, we do something similar. We bunch of positive and negative brains. 
We can now add an extra set of brains here, positive brains, M of them, move them together, and what you see or you're left with is just an, a, a bunch of metal fields on the side. So actually, I think that's uh, one derivation. In our paper, paper, we do two other derivations. We show also that in some sense, these, the complex structure on the generalized top nut space has this similar structure. And in fact, we have also an element uh, derivation using uh, instanton calculations. So um, I have to summarize. Um, so I think actually the conclusions of this is that uh, this, this whole collection of interesting ideas uh, about signature chains, about non-unitary theories, about supergroups, and remarkable, all of these are connected. So I would kind of challenge any of you to see whether we can kind of formally prove or disprove the existence of that. If that's the case, uh, there'll be kind of a unification of crazy ideas because we can kind of uh, throw them all away at the same time, uh, which might be a good solution. And I would say then we need some other crazy ideas. Uh, so perhaps I should uh, end by these famous words of Gaucho Marx. These are my principles. And if you don't like them, I have others. Thank you very much. Yes, so yes. Do you suggest that has to be the um, it's a good point. So um, I think there's, uh, I, I should have said that, that it's not strictly, I mean, there's some cases where it actually, I think, is a modular function, but often it's, it's not. And we, so we know that there have to be, uh, add, we have to add these kind of uh, extra non-holomorphic parts. Um, it's actually, it's a great suggestion or something. You know, it's, it's, uh, I was more using it as a metaphor, but um, no, it's a very good point. It's a very good point. Yeah, um, the inside of uh, Western Nordstrom behind the event horizon, uh, I think has a brain of positive charge and negative energy. Uh-huh. And it's symmetric. Could that be related to what? To your negative brain? That's a good point. In fact, uh, I didn't have time, but um, it, it, because I didn't make in any way clear why this might be connected to probing behind the black hole. But one thing, actually, how it started, that is work that cumulated. If you do this in the simplest possible model, just matrix models, then we know that we get these effective geometries which have two sheets. And actually, you need kind of these negative brains or negative probes to probe the second sheet. So the, I mean, in some sense, our intuition always is that uh, you have to go to these kind of, you have to add these pairs of brains and, and ne positive and negative brains to actually uh, probe part of the geometry that you cannot probe just by using kind of the unitary theory. Um, but this actually, this suggestion is uh, much more direct. So it's a wonderful suggestion and that's a very good point. Oh, I'm not in a position to give the status, but I, uh, the, 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 the remark is actually a very, very, very simple remark. So if you want to understand why, say in a naive fashion, you get this, this why you get a uh, different kind of uh, space-time signature in the neighborhood of one of these negative brains. Now, if you can say, well, you think about how, these, uh, uh, how space emerges in holography, it's essentially one of the scalar fields you know, that is transverse to the brain that will be part of the space-time geometry. So the kinetic term for these scalar fields is intimately connected to the signature that you get. So if you want to create a direction which has a negative signature, it looks like you might have also the problem of uh, the wrong kinetic term in terms of your scalar Lagrangian. I think Juan. Yeah, so you, you mentioned that the theories 
or u n slash n was the same as s u n minus m? Yes. So relatively, at what stage do they differ? How do I see the difference? So uh, the, the, the one question where we can actually answer that is in terms of just of matrix models, which is the zero dimensional model. So in that case, actually, we were able to kind of regularize the matrix integral. And we find that the answer, say, compare, we did like compare un to un plus one slash one, that actually you get contributions which are non-perturbatively different. So they go like e to the minus n in terms of, uh, so there are extra terms there that you, uh, you get by, the matrix models can be defined non-perturbatively just by picking the right contour, contours of the eigenvalue. So that's what we found there. But perhaps, Kumi, you want to add something to it? Yes, so they just said on that. So they differ by the chasm. So if you go to chasm is higher order than n, the un plus 1 slash 1 differs from the un. So you have no operators. So if you go to operators of n, n uh, string of fields, then you choose the same. So that's the in terms of chasm, you can find new options. So UN plus one slash one has more options than UN. I think the whole thing is a little bit weird about time this morning. Yes.